Tonight on Stu Does America, does the word democratic make socialism better? We're apparently getting closer and closer to finding out. Michael Malice is here to talk about the future of the right and to tell us why a little chaos in our political lives is a good thing. And a Bloomberg advisor advises us about something we never wanted to be advised about. If you want some advice that will actually really make a difference, click subscribe on your podcast app or on YouTube. It's free for you and it makes me feel loved. And click the bell on YouTube to get a heads up whenever we post a new video. You can get access to all of Blaze TV by subscribing at blazetv.com slash stew. And use the code stew because that's how they know you like this stupid show. And you'll save 10 bucks. By the way, I love the fact that you keep rating with five stars and reviewing this podcast. It's great. Whatever. We have an abnormally high amount of reviews for the number of shows we've actually done. So thank you for being such an abnormal audience. Like me, you woke up today kind of hoping that the Bernie surge was a flash in the pan. Well, I have some good news for you. There's still plenty of time to book your airline tickets and flee the country. So, yeah, you're all, you're fine. Yes, Bernie is the overwhelming favorite to win the nomination. Not a lock, but a definite favorite. Allow that to sink in as we look at Nate Silver's chances to win on Super Tuesday. Uh, look at these states. We've got, uh, let's see, hmm. California, Sanders, 79% chance. In Texas, Sanders, 59% chance. In North Carolina, Sanders, over 52%, uh, to only 24% for Biden. Uh, Virginia, Sanders with 49%, still a 25-point lead over Biden. Massachusetts, Sanders, 57%, and Warren, 26 Warren must just be, I mean, uh, oh, gosh. Um, uh, Minnesota is one where Klobuchar leads at the moment, 49 to 45 uh, Colorado, 83% Sanders. Tennessee, 45% Sanders over Biden by 12. Biden does lead in Alabama, though, so he's got that going on for him. And the last few states, Oklahoma is Sanders leading, which is amazing. Uh, Ar- uh, 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 is that Arkansas? Yeah, I can't, I'm sorry, I'm missing the uh, graphic here. Sanders, 40%. Uh, Utah, 87% for Sanders, which is surprising to me. Maine, 67% Sanders. Vermont, 99% Sanders. I think he might win Vermont. I'm going to go out on a limb right now and predict that. That's a lock. You can take that to the bank, bet it all you can. And Sanders, 38% chance to win. I believe that's American Samoa. And you can take that one to the bank as well. So, I mean, we're totally screwed. Uh, but seriously, the, the surge uh, does actually present some serious issues, like which country should you flee to? Here's a little travel tip. You can check out this list of countries. How do you find the sincerity of Sandinista leaders? I was impressed. I was impressed by Father Descoto because he is a very gentle, very loving man. Uh, Ortega is an impressive guy. But I remember, for some reason or other, being very excited when, when Fidel Castro made the revolution in Cuba. I was a kid and I remember reading that. And it was just seemed right and appropriate that poor people were rising up against rather ugly rich people. We didn't do a study of these things, but people there seem reasonably happy and, and content. I didn't notice much deprivation. Senator, why have you stopped short of calling Maduro of Venezuela a dictator? Well, there are still democratic operations taking place in that country. Oh, oh, okay. Well, if there's still democratic operations taking place, I would just advise you to go anywhere except in those countries. Bernie loves them. You probably don't want to go there. Oh, Stu, you're being so dramatic. Maybe. Or maybe not. I mean, they're literally eating flamingos in Venezuela these days, which is actually better than some of the other options. Uh, if you have the choice between flamingo and dog, I'm going pretty much with the, pr- the pink bird. I mean, every time. Pollo tropical. Am I paranoid? It's possible. It's possible. But even though I do need to lose a few pounds, I don't want to be around when the Bernie diet emerges. What's our pink flamingo going to be around here? I mean, we're talking, I mean, if you, because you people, you start eating bald eagles, I'm going to get really pissed. Don't do it. Don't do it. I will be interested, though, to see what they have over at KFE, Kentucky Fried Eagle. I mean, it could be delicious. Maybe a nice KFE Eagle Bowl. Mmm. Or some delectable bite-sized popcorn eagle. Hell, this is America. What would we be without the Colonel's classic eagle bucket? Mm -mm Mmm-mm-mm. So we know that socialism is kind of horrible and leads to massive death counts and suffering whenever it's tried. 
I mean, not everybody knows that. But to be a socialist in 2020 needs, means you kind of need to be a little bit of an elusive socialist. You'll notice when Bernie gets backed into a corner on the socialist label, he responds like so. We must recognize that in the 21st century, mm -hmm. in the wealthiest country in the history of the world, economic rights are human rights. Oh. Okay. And that is what I mean by democratic socialism. <laughs> oh, okay. So you just mean the thing that it doesn't mean. I got it. Phew. I was worried there for a second. He only wants economic rights for humans. And that sounds safe. And here I thought he liked communist dictators. How dumb of me. It's unfair to simply say everything is bad. You know, when Fidel Castro came into office, you know what he did? He had a massive literacy program. Is that a bad thing? Mm. Even though Fidel Castro did it? Kind of. You know who brings up a good point on this one? I hate to say it. Freaking former Mayor Pete. So this is part of what I'm getting at when I say that in our one shot to defeat Donald Trump, we should think carefully about the consequences of nominating Senator Sanders. I don't want, as a Democrat, I don't want to be explaining why our nominee is encouraging people to look on the bright side of the Castro regime when we're going into the election of our lives. We need to stand unequivocally against dictatorships everywhere in the world. And so you don't think that's a good ex excuse? He's, he, he says he thinks he's a dictator, yep. but... Literacy is a good thing. There's no nuance to that. Why are we spotlighting? Of course, literacy is a good thing, but why are we spotlighting the literacy programs of a brutal dictator instead of being unambiguous in our condemnation about the way he has treated his own people? Damn you, Bernard. Ah! How dare you make Mayor Pete look good? I, I'm very pissed off at you. No, no, Stu, he's a democratic socialist. It's like socialism with all the bad, without all the bad stuff. I got it. And I've heard this argument many, many times. Um, you know, I, I almost forgot they are so different. And it's true. It's kind of like the Olsen twins. Democratic socialism is the Olsen twin on the left. And socialism is the Olsen twin on the right. Or is it the reverse? I don't know exactly. Either way, you can surely detect the difference. One hasn't eaten anything in like six weeks, the other in like four weeks, which is more than you can say for most of the citizens of Venezuela. You can't just slap democratic on the word socialism and suddenly make everything better. For example, take a bunch of white nationalists. Well, everybody doesn't like those guys, right? But if I just tweak it slightly, then that's not white nationalism. That's democratic white nationalism. Problem solved, right? Well, guess what? You're still kind of a racist jackass. And uh, I'm sorry, a democratic racist jackass. That might sound like a ridiculous example. So let me give you one that's very real. In one of our oh-so-successful attempts to help turn the Middle East into a Disneyland that we all know it can be one day, uh, Ismail uh, Hania, which I've, I mean, I'm just super familiar with, was elected by three points. Democracy in action! You might not know his name, but you know his name brand. It's Hamas. Yes, Hamas was democratically elected. Or check out this headline about Lebanon, the secret to Hezbollah's electoral success. Oh, 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 I can't wait to find out their secret. Remember, it's not terrorism. It's democratic terrorism, which makes it much, much better. Here's a message that you'll only get here on Stu Does America. Sometimes democracy blows. It's true. In fact, it can tend to codify the worst instincts of the mob. In the case of the Middle East, the mob seems to have an incredible desire to make sure Jews are no longer Jews and perhaps a little more dead. And that's just one of the reasons our founders decided to start a constitutional republic instead of a democracy. It has elements of democracy, sure, but constitutional restraints act like a tranquilizer dart when, you know, the, the elephant starts chasing after the kindergartners, which is never a pretty scene. The word democracy tests well, so pasting it onto your crappy idea is the trendy thing to do for authoritarians. But we shouldn't fall for it, and we shouldn't forget the past. Bernie Sanders has always praised socialism, and the examples he comes up with all the time were pretty consistently not democratic. The Soviet Union? Revolution. Cuba? Revolution. Nicaragua? Revolution. Bernie is depending on the media to run interference for him so that you won't know that he added democratic to socialism like six minutes ago. I will say, though, to be fair, six minutes in Bernie time is like a few years to you and I. 
He's like the reverse of a dog. He's been alive for so long that a century for us seems like a three day weekend to him. So how do you understand what democratic socialism really is? Here's the definitive Stu does America guide to democratic socialism. Let's try it. When you can't call yourself a communist, you call yourself a socialist. When you can't call yourself a socialist, you call yourself a democratic socialist. When you can't call yourself a democratic socialist, you call yourself a Democrat. Remember these simple rules and you'll know all you need to know about Bernie Sanders, the squad and every other Carl come lately that pitches Marxism under the latest marketing slogan. There's this clip of Dick Van Dyke, who is one of the three people on earth who can credibly look at Bernie Sanders and use the word youngster. He doesn't understand why older voters aren't embracing Ver Bernie. I can't understand why, according to the polls, he's having problems with older citizens like me. Mm. That is that's just shock. I don't know. I can't can't put my finger on it. And I also don't know why I would take political advice from the star of Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. But could it be that older voters actually remember socialism? They might have known family members who were disappeared off the earth because of socialism. This is going to sound crazy to Bernie and Dick, but older voters uh, are the people who don't see Disney's miracle as a horror movie. They were rooting for the United States the whole time to win, which must seem insane to you guys. But socialism works on younger voters because, to quote Jonah Goldberg, it's a simple fact of science that nothing correlates more with ignorance and stupidity than youth. We're all born idiots and we only get over that condition as we get less young. To younger voters, socialism is like, you know, like loaded fries. They're incredibly enticing, but it's going to brutalize your waistline. You can't deny it. It's going to clog your arteries and it's going to stop your heart dead in its tracks. Trust me. Some people think I don't even have a heart, but in reality, it just stopped beating approximately 14 years ago. Sanders is like loaded fries. I mean, luring everyone in with a promise of unlimited pleasure at absolutely no cost. That should be a red flag, and conveniently, it is with a fancy yellow hammer and sickle attached to it. Young voters eat this stuff up. It's free. You don't have to do anything at all. And that pitch sounds great when you're toward the beginning of your life and when you haven't put any money away yet. And the defining moment of your political existence is not the Berlin Wall or 9-11. It's the 2008 financial collapse, where Newsweek was running headlines like we're all socialists now. The messaging is simple. You are a victim of capitalism. You saw what your parents went through. Do you want that to happen again? We can all get potential pain and take it, get it taken away from the government. The government can make you happy and satisfied. We can make you whole. And now that sounds like the pitch from a cult leader. That's because it is. Who does America? Very excited to be joined by Michael Malice, who's the author of Dear Reader, the unauthorized autobiography of Kim Jong-il, and his latest, The New Right, A Journey to the Fringe of American Politics. Michael, thanks for coming on, man. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, no, this is great. The book is, is I'm really interested in it. It's got a, you have a, you kind of take us on a journey. Yep. Um, and you actually did a lot of this in person. You actually did a lot of legwork on oh, yeah. trying to figure out what the new right is. What is it? Uh, I'm going to see if I get the quote exactly right. Mm -hmm. It's long. Mm -hmm. The new right is a loosely connected group of individuals united by their opposition to progressivism, which they perceive to be a thinly veiled fundamentalist religion dedicated to egalitarian principles and intent on world domination via globalist hegemony. That's right off the top of your head, right? But I think I got it right. <laughs> no, you got it right. You actually um, it. But the premise is it, it's how it differs from conservatism is both the fact that what these people have in common is very little. It's what they have in common is what they're opposed to, mm -hmm. but also their perspective on progressivism, the nature of progressivism, the nature of the media, the nature of the universities. They're far more ostensibly to the right than most conservatives are. Yeah, and, and, and let's start with the media because, sure. I, you know, the media is, you know, you're not going to be, of course, people here uh, watching The Blaze are not typically fans uh, of mainstream yes, media, of but there's a real reason for it, I think. I mean, they, they, you know, there's this thing where Trump says uh, the media is the enemy of the people. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there are times where you sit back and you say, uh, you know, they act like it a lot. Sure. Um, first of all, I would... I would tweak you a little bit. I always say corporate press instead of mainstream media mm -hmm. because I don't think their ideology is mainstream. I think their ideology is very radical. Sometimes mm -hmm. the mask drops. 
and when you saw, uh, one of my quotes is the corporate press, the enemy of the people, when you have Joe Biden refer to that woman as a dog-faced horse, horse soldier, whatever it was, it was a John Wayne quote. <laughs> yeah. right? And the headlines say, mm -hmm. Joe Biden makes joke about John Wayne movie, fine. Mm -hmm. When you have cadets playing the circle game, which was on Malcolm in the Middle, and it's an old game, the headlines are, uh, cadets seem to show white supremacist symbols. Yeah. Yeah. So what you see is, when it's uh, one of their own, they're going to explain and provide information, but if it's someone who is ostensibly not on their side, they will have no problem uh, ruining your children's lives and patting themselves on the back and call them heroes for it. And that's the difference between having a bias and an agenda. If you're biased, you can say, hey, this symbol has, con has connotations, but this is a game that kids play and maybe they don't realize it. Right. You give both sides. Yeah. Agenda is we are seeking out people to demonize, humiliate, and destroy who are often weaker than us. Ostensibly leftism, historically, is about looking out for the little guy. Right. Nick, Nick Sandman is, not, is the little guy. Yes. These cadets are the little guy. And uh, kids who are trapped in public schools are the little guy. And they will all be grist for the mill in the service of this you know, horrific uh, organization. You had a great, uh, you had a great uh, quote uh, that um, the, the media is factual um, but not truthful. Correct. Which is just a great perspective on this. Can, can you walk us through this? Because this is, a, uh, this is something, and you pointed this out as well on your, your, tw your very lengthy Twitter thread. Um, where you kind of go through these uh, qualifications that the media does and yes. how they introduce people and how they kind of set the table. Yeah, so here's an example. So people are like, how could something be truthful, not factual, right? Uh, uh, factual, but not truthful. Here's an example. Let's suppose I buy a supermarket and I'm shutting it down. I'm opening a clothing store. Mm -hmm. Headline, Michael Malice refuses to sell food to hungry children. <laughs> right. Or, if they really want to go for it, Michael Malice refuses to sell food to hungry minority children. That is factual. Mm -hmm. I'm closing on the supermarket. I'm not selling food. It's not truthful. Uh, someone came at me and they said, how can you say this? Factual or truthful? I go, simple. Your mother is an ape. Yeah, it's biologically true. Every human being is an ape. But that's not the connotation there. <laughs> sure. So they will use these examples many times. Like, for example, another one they use with President Trump. President Trump attacks women. No one with any semblance of sanity will make the claim that President Trump refrains from attacking men right. on a general basis. <laughs> when he goes after Schiff, calls yeah. it pencil neck Schiff, he's not just attacking him personally, he's attacking his masculinity. So mm -hmm. when you take something that is part of a broader narrative and make it uh, seem more significant than it is, that is a fact, but it is not the truth. Uh, so they do this all the time. What you're referring to is that master threat I have as, as an aside. Mm. And this is, again, the difference between bias and agenda. And a bias is... You know, I'm a lefty, Stu works for Glenn, blah, 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 you know, and then they'll add maybe controversial comments that, you, that you've made. Sure, then there's but many. if it's an agenda, the controversy is front and center because my job is training the audience to perceive you in a certain way. So we saw this with Joe Rogan. If you went to Wikipedia, if you ask anyone, what's Joe Rogan known for? Podcaster, comedian, yep. MMA. Mm -hmm. CNN, CNN, Joe Rogan, comma, who has a history of transphobic and racist <laughs> yeah. jokes, comma, that's not what he's known for. That is what you are trying to make your viewers perceive him as. And that is why it's an agenda and not merely, as con uh, many conservatives often think, oh, it's a bias, they just keep making mistakes. We all know, you are friends with lefties, I'm friends yeah. with a lot of lefties. Mm -hmm. You can have conversations with them. That's not how they look at things, that's not how they talk. They're not trying to manipulate and frame the conversation preemptively. Yeah, cause, I mean, I see this and I think it's, it's always been there at some level. Yes. Um, it, it does seem to be, further along maybe now than it used to be in that like i always say this with trump and that i don't think the 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 issue with the media and trump is their bias against trump or their bias against conservatives or republicans it's their obsession with him in particular it stands out to me in that like they seemingly they'll, they'll take any story whether it's related to him or not and bring it back to him and what he's doing wrong on it you know, d diseases are starting. He's all, they're already setting the table here for the coronavirus thing where they're going to be saying he's been incompetent and that's why all these people are dying around the planet. Yes. Um, th there's this uh, hyper focus on, on them as almost an activist organization. It's our yes. job to remove him at any cost, whether we have to sacrifice every little bit of our integrity to do it or not. It's not just him, though. You know, once mm. he's gone, it's not like Mike Pence is going to get a free ride. Although <laughs> right. I think Mike Pence would have a better shot at it because he's been a member of the establishment. Yeah. Just this morning, when I was getting on my flight in New York, uh, they were talking about, uh, this was CNN again, President Trump had a tweet saying that Justice Sotomayor and Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg should recuse themselves in the future. They quote his tweet accurately. They go, what he didn't bring up 
is that Clarence Thomas should recuse himself because Clarence Thomas' wife, X, Y, Z. I'm like, this is a complete non sequitur. Everyone in right. Washington is married to somebody, and it's, it's, he's not attacking Sotomayor's husband on a specific case. Right. He's attacking things that she said as a justice on the record. So the mm. fact that it's this casual, like, well, he should also do this to be fair, this is you giving talking points to your viewers so when they're in the office, when they're in social media, they know how to promulgate the message and spread the, your kind of revolution. What you just described is something that the other candidate might say. Sure. If they were on a debate stage. And fairly with him. so. Yeah, and fairly so. But they will be on the debate stage asking the questions as this uh, independent moderator. Right. And I, I mean, are we past the point where the American people actually buy that anymore? Uh, thankfully, uh, the, the, I, one of my other quotes is the battle is won when the average American looks at a corporate journalist exactly as they regard a tobacco executive. <laughs> they have a job, they're often smart. Uh, they're educated, but they are pushing something that is maybe pleasurable in the moment, but is long term very nefarious. And I think that mm. ship has very heavily sailed, especially among conservatives. There was a chart that said, do you trust the corporate press and conservatives and independents? The numbers just went to the tank right. with the left. It went up a little. The next step, which is the last step in dismantling this kind of uh, century long um, organization is the universities. Uh, once people realize that this is where the poison starts, once people realize this is where they go to train young, impressionable minds to be the shock troops for the progressive militia, that's when you know America will be truly saved, in my view. And aren't we moving past that, too? I oh, mean, yes. Because you certainly have, on the right, real skepticism as to what people are getting taught. I mean, I talk to you know parents all the time that, you know, I have kids that are younger. Um, they're not near college age yet, but, you know, you start thinking about these things. I don't want to even go into college because the way that they, uh, you know, would be indoctrinated there is, is terrifying, I think, to conservatives, at least at this point. Sure. But beyond that, too, you just have market forces, I think, where you're you can't charge fifty thousand dollars a year for something that I mean, all the knowledge is out there. It's not to say that there's no value in college. There may be. Well, the credentials enormous. So it, that, I mean, yeah. having a Harvard mm -hmm. diploma will always open many doors for you. And, and yeah. it, it, it's priceless in terms of networking. But here, let's take all the politics out of it. Yep. You are telling me I have to take out four years of my youth. I'm out 200 grand. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a cost. At the same time, it's easier and easier to open a business, especially when you're young. If I have a Shopify store, you don't know how old I am. You don't know what I look like. Yep. So this, as this becomes easier and more and more source of being lucrative, and then I could have a startup or whatever and be a millionaire by the time I'm 25, this gets harder and harder to defend. So this, in a sense, the market, as with everything else, is solving the problem for itself. Yeah, I mean, uh, Brian Kaplan's book, uh, Oh yes, he's against the best. education, he's so good. And he put the credentialing thing, he hits so hard, and it makes so much sense. We're in that, like, a person could go through four years of college and graduate with a D minus, um, and another person could go through and have all A pluses and not show up on the last day and not get his diploma. And America would hire the guy who got the D minus. And this is also a function of how hard public schools are, yeah. because it, it wasn't that long ago where having a public school diploma would at least guarantee, you know, I, okay, I know what I'm getting. If I go to McDonald's anywhere in the world, I'm not getting hot cuisine, but I know what that chicken McNugget's gonna look like, and it's gonna yeah. be good. It's gonna be good in India, it's gonna be good in China, it's gonna be good in the States. I know it used to be, oh, Harvard uh, High School diploma, this guy can at least read, and now that that's no longer the case, it's like, okay, now that Harvard or even some, and not to denigrate a community school, but that person has gotten higher education, at least now. And that's why they want it pushed further and further. They want you to spend more and more time being subject to education. And that's less and less time yeah. that people are being productive in an economic sense. The, the argument here, I guess, against what you're saying is there's institutions that are important, right? I mean, the media is an important institution. They, they're supposed to hold them responsible. And are there problems? Sure. But we can't just break it up. Universities. We can. Maybe I can. Maybe you can. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate. Okay, well, I mean, devil is, is the right word. Yeah, there is the idea that these institutions are important and they give some sort of societal value, keeping things together. There's nothing to that? Uh, no, not when you're talking <laughs> about organizations that defended, yeah. that covered up both Stalin's genocide and Hitler's genocide, mm -hmm. uh, like the New York Times has. Uh, not when you're talking about organizations. They are defending, the, the thing is what conservatives don't often appreciate, when you're defending conservatism, this country has been under the sway of progressivism for a century. Yeah. So if you're defending the status quo and the way things used to be, you're defending Harry Truman, you're defending Woodrow Wilson, you're defending FDR, the idea that if your industry is having a strike, the government can go in and seize it and run it by itself, as Harry Truman wanted to do. This was even far beyond anything Bernie Sanders wants. So I think conservatives need to appreciate more how long they've been at this game, that things haven't just gotten worse now, it's just that you've gotten better eyeglasses and are being more perceptive. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is going to be a long fight to uh, turn them back. So when the conservatives look at the media, yeah. they see problems. They see an alignment between uh, the left and the media. Yes. What are they getting wrong about this? 
Uh, I think they think that the, the reporters answer to the DNC, where it's actually the inverse. So the media is the one who's mm. programmed. If it wasn't for the media, Nancy Pelosi would never have had impeachment. She would never have had to have impeachment. If I'm a Democratic congressman, right? That's really interesting. And yeah. I go home for three years, my constituents have heard Trump, Russia, Trump, Russia, Trump, Russia from CNN, MSNBC, Vox, all the other establishment. How can I, as a Democratic congressman, go to town hall to see my constituents and say, I think Trump's a Klansman, I think he's Hitler, I think he's the worst, I think he's a putz, but I don't see grounds for removing the first president from office on this. <laughs> right. I can't do that as a yeah. congressman. So that is telling you who's wagging the dog and where the actual information and control is coming from. Oh, that's really interesting because I, I think... Uh I mean, you, so it really is a chicken and egg situation. It's originating with the media. Because they used to say this about conservatives, too, where they would say talk radio right. is so conservative and they're so hate mongery. And they go and they go to Washington, D.C. and they push all these congressmen around. Um, that I wish. I mean, I That's the fantasy. <laughs> we're so we're the, the worst bullies in the world. We never get anything done. Um, it would be interesting to see that because I, th I think that is a as I hold my uh, Nancy Pelosi sucks pen. You can buy, by the way. I have uh, a mammoth molar pen, which okay. you can get at Full Hills Antiques. There you go. <laughs> that is good too. Um, Just as old as Nancy. <laughs> but it did seem at the beginning, and I don't know if this is strategy or not, that Nancy Pelosi didn't want to go to impeachment. She seemed to see the downside, and, and they're feeling it, I think, now. I mean, I think the Democrats are feeling what a bad decision that was. Um, but I, I don't think initially her political sort of uh, vibe of the situation would have indicated, let's go for impeachment on this phone call. But yeah. she... She just seemed like she was pushed over the edge by everybody. I, is that fair? I, I think Nancy Pelosi, despite being here, is a very bright woman. And uh, the reason is, if you saw Obamacare, she mm -hmm. got a lot of those Democrats to vote for a bill that they knew they were going to lose their seats. Yeah. And to get and a congressman did. to do that, mm -hmm. takes it's not a no joke. And yeah. she did it. So I was shocked that she was going through. And I thought, OK, maybe this is the inverse. Maybe it's now, as they say online, it's Nancy Pelosi who's playing 4D chess. She's right. got some scheme that I'm not aware of. And then you saw it being delivered to the Senate and Mitch McConnell smirking. And he's like, I don't know what leverage Nancy Pelosi thinks she has it here, but she doesn't. Let's get this bill and we're going to clear him. And then she, all she's reduced to is trying to say, as her dentures slip out, that Trump's impeached forever. It's like a cool story, lady. So I was shocked by how much I either overestimated her intelligence, which I don't think I have, but overestimated her control over her caucus. And we see a history with this. John Boehner famously quick because like I can't manage these guys anymore yeah. because the Republicans were getting uh, a little bit too radical for him because he wanted to cut deals with President Obama. Mm, really interesting. All right. Mike, more with Michael Malice here in just a second. We're back with Michael Malice, author of The New Right. Uh, Mike, Michael, it was 2014. I don't know if you remember this, that you came on The Wonderful World of Stew. Yeah, of course I remember it. It was a big deal for me. It was, was it really? Yes, honestly, of oh, course, yeah. yes. That's a long time. Six years ago yeah. now. That's crazy. It doesn't seem like Well, and, and I'll just I'll kill the mood a little bit. Every mm -hmm. single person who I met in North Korea, who I wrote about in the book, is still there. Yeah, so I, this is something uh, that haunts me constantly. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that is... That, Probably your, if you have one big issue, I mean, the book is not about North Korea, the the, the most recent one, but right. that is, of course, your probably your biggest passion. Oh, of course. And the fact that I at all had a part in moving the needle. And, you know, when I was on the show with you and Glenn not that long ago, and the first thing he opened up was talking about the plight of the North Korean people. The fact that the conversation has yeah. changed from let's attack them to like, oh, my God, we have slaves and, and genocide and under our own eyes. I, I think I, if I take any little bit of credit for that, I'm very delighted. It's true because, I mean, you know, you, you did it in a very entertaining way in your book, but I mean, it. Uh, we, I think, a lot of times look for some reason at North Korea as, as this sort of like silly sideshow as right. opposed to Hitler or Stalin or Mao, real tragedies. North Korea is on that level. Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, one to two million people died in the 90s because the government refused to give them food. They had polio. I mean, mm. uh, the fact that things are getting a little bit better than there is a, a great. The fact that President Trump brought it to public consciousness, I was very, very happy about. Are you happy with the way Trump's handled it? Uh, I, I was happy to some extent because there was traction at the same time when you have these rulers, uh, when they step down, they personally get killed. Yeah. You look at Libya, you look at Saddam Hussein, you look at Romania. So he's, uh, Kim Jong-un uh, is in a tough spot himself. But anyone who makes us talk about North Korea and what's happening there I, is something that I'm in favor of. Because Obama didn't do much with it. And I'm not even going to criticize him because it's a hard nut to crack. So I don't even know what he, he should have done necessarily. It is. It's, it's, I mean, it's an almost impossible situation right. to deal with. Um, let's go back to the, the kind of the premise of the book. Because sure. you talk about the new right, 
and that, you know, these groups are sort of aligned in just opposition to progressivism. Yes. You see real fringes of the of that movement. Oh, of course. Sometimes it gets pretty dark. I mean, oh, you yeah. were you went to Charlottesville. You've yeah. never been. It's the new Milan. No, <laughs> really, no. It's just <laughs> yeah, I was there. Window. My With friend the Nazis, actually. Yeah. My friend used to live in Charlottesville. He he's a huge Dave Matthews fan. Oh, okay. And, and that's I'm where she, that's that. where they're from. I know. Hey, look, you know, Basic, hey, yikes. we don't judge here. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, but uh, we. <laughs> <laughs> well, you do. You okay. judge very much. Um, so, but he loved them. Went actually to go work for his company because that's where they were based. And he knew Charlottesville as this like idyllic place like oh, yeah. this wonderful city and now all people talk about is like you know this terrible rally and people getting run over and and all this racist chaos yeah. and these poor people who live there i can't imagine what happened to their property values through That's this right. incident yeah um, but you were there you oh, were yeah. you actually saw it. can you give us a little bit of the of what it was like sure uh, i had been hearing about this rally for months because of my work mm -hmm. and i thought there would be like 20 people there and actually i was this close to being one of the speakers because i wanted to get in front of the nazis and tell them my favorite contestants of rupaul's drag race in no particular <laughs> order because i knew half the nazis would know it's troll half them would go crazy yeah. which is perfect right. um but there were no speakers and this what people don't appreciate um the streets were, there are far more antifa people than there were nazis and mm -hmm. they were itching for a fight they grabbed my friend Bob's cowboy hat and they were like looking for trouble at the same time you can understand why because this is you know ground zero for kind of you know in yeah. many cases uh, white supremacy because they the Nazis were there so it was a very very intense situation uh, it was also intense like being with uh, some of the kind of the organizers and seeing how their reactions were especially when someone was killed you know which is obviously a horrific and, and, yeah. and no joke and watching it on CNN go from what I thought would be like 20 people to yeah, like the news of the week was like holy and that march the night before with the tiki torches yeah i did not know that that was going to happen so i'm in virginia not in charlottesville the night before seeing that on tv i'm like oh this is no joke this is this really sick and and dark yeah one of the things i think is interesting about you is that you really like i really don't like the back and forth online i i i the the conflict to me it repels me and i i just want to hide you do not <laughs> You like walk in there face first and you'll mix it up with anybody and you're hilarious on Twitter. Um, but like you, this is more than just fun for you, right? Like you think that, the, that this sort of chaotic environment is actually a positive in a way when oh. it comes to our politics. Oh, uh, first of all, uh, fans send me money to buy things that I don't want called spike funding. So yeah. this, they pay for this mammoth pen. Nice. No, <laughs> I like the chaos because it's a great way to tear down the way the New York Times, the way Hillary Clinton, the way any government agency gets over is by authority and by people regarding them as someone you should listen to. So when you have someone who is regarded as a buffoon, as a clown, you, the skepticism comes with it. So I think it's very great when you have people like Lawrence Tribe, who is you know, essential to getting Robert Bork not being on the Supreme Court. He's mm -hmm. a major a Harvard law figure. So you look at him, you're like, oh, this isn't some erudite scholar. This guy is, can I say ass? This guy's sure. just a total ass <laughs> mm -hmm. who's petty and miserable. And this is not someone you should look up to and aspire, yeah. but this is a toxic force that you should avoid. That is the beauty of social media. And the more toxicity that I can bring mm -hmm. to the surface, the more you can flush it and have cleanliness after. It's true because, you know, it really does bring people to earth. I remember when Glenn first got on, on Fox News, and I think it was Fox, it may have been CNN. And he was doing one of his little famous chalkboard things. Yeah. And he goes up there and he, 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 was, he writes a word up and it was, it was the way we had written it. He kind of got confused in the middle of the word and kind of stopped and then went back to it and wound up misspelling the word. Oh, and it was he's Hitler everywhere. Yeah, he was basically Adolf Hitler, the dumbest person who had ever lived. This is kind of before Twitter really yeah. takes off. Now, every celebrity, every like, you know, Supreme Court justices are misspelling words all the time. You realize how human people are. They're no longer statues. But it's also the fact that if you spell that word correctly, you're bragging about your fourth grade education level. Great. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's possible you're both morons, right? You realize that? <laughs> it, that's what they don't get. Yeah, yeah no, it's true. Um, so what's the solution? We got about 45 seconds. Why not solve the world's problems? <laughs> wait, 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 what do you mean? What's the solution? How do we get to somewhere that's actually, uh, how, does, how do we take what we have now, which we both agree, I think, is screwed up? and get to somewhere that's better. Oh, easy. Even if everything the left says about Trump is true, you still have the capacity, every single person listening to this, to have a better life tomorrow, to be a better person tomorrow. So find your joy. This is America. The opportunities are still limitless. And do not let cynicism take hold of your soul. That's it. Mm, that's great. All right, Michael Malice, you solved the world's problems. And you, you still have 20 seconds left. You just wanna, do you want to go over your uh, RuPaul Drag Race contestants real quick? No, because the show's gotten too Disney. Okay, okay. <laughs> that's yeah, true. Yeah, I so mean, we I can, can all agree yeah, on that. Yeah. We've had that conversation before. <laughs> all right, uh, the new right is the name of the book, Michael Malice. Thanks so much for coming Thanks, on, man. Dude. appreciate it. Back in a second. Welcome back. I appreciate you tuning in and subscribing and YouTube and podcasts and wherever else you're 
paying attention to. If you're if you're if you're stealing the stream, even though it's free, subscribe there too. It means a lot to us. I uh, want to go over uh, the hot pocket story today, and I want to I don't want to get you hungry. And I know this is a controversial opinion. I could dig myself a hot pocket. I have no problem with them. You know what? I don't have no problem with t- taking something out of my freezer and throwing it in a sleeve and chucking it in the microwave oven, and it gets kind of crispy on the outside, and it's like liquid, you know, volcano hot in the inside. I don't. I have no problem with it. Okay. I know everyone makes fun of them. Jim Gaffigan has probably taken down the stock price single-handedly by like half um, because he makes fun of them so well. But I mean, I can eat a I can eat a hot pocket. I'm fine with them. This story isn't necessarily about how much I like Hot Pockets, though. It's about the, uh, one of the heirs to the Hot Pocket fortune, which apparently there is one. Uh, her name is Michelle uh, Genevis, and uh, she got in trouble. She got in trouble. She, is going, uh, she was going to go to 21 months in prison, uh, is what they wanted to get her on. Why? Well, she was involved in the college admissions scandal. This is the most serious issue that has ever occurred. You think coronavirus is serious? You think a couple million people potentially get infected with, a, with some disease that might kill a bunch of them is, is a problem? Maybe a little bit, but not as much as the Hot Pocket lady and the money she paid to get her kid into college. Uh, this was a, a big story. As we know, Aunt Becky uh, got in trouble for this as well. And I keep coming back to the same observation, which is why on earth are we arresting people for paying money to get their kids into college? First of all, that's part of the process almost all the time when you put your kid in college. They, they charge exorbitant fees, and you put your kids in college, and we're supposed to be um, doing that within the bounds of the law. But because she paid an extra, I think, 100 k to have somebody take a, the, like the ACT test for her kid, I think that very well might be bad parenting. Um, it very well might be well-intentioned bad parenting, but it's still... I don't think I want to teach my kid that's how the world works, per se. However, to put them in jail for 21 months because they paid too much money to put their kid in school? You know what? If, if I was a kid and my mom did that for me, you know what I would give them? A hug. I, would, I love you, Mommy. Thank you for taking care of me. Again, it's not a great idea to do this for your kid. Your kid should be getting places on merit, and they should be understanding that you're not going to pay their way through life. It's probably not a good uh habit to teach them that mommy will bail them out at any given point. But I mean, can we take a step back here? We have 21 months is less than like a lot of child molesters go to prison. We're talking about a a, a person who took their money, their own money, and paid someone to take a test for their kid. It's not a good idea. Should they get tossed out of school for it? Yeah, probably. If it worked and they got into school, should they get tossed out of school? Yeah, probably. Is this is this a legal matter? Is it really a legal matter? I don't I just don't I, I am fascinated by the story and how how many people it's now 36 parents have been charged and 53 people overall. She had to pay a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar fine. I like how we just have this pepperoni hot pocket up next to me this entire segment. <laughs> every, time I, every time I look up, I just see oh, there's a pepperoni hot pocket. It's right there. Um, you know, look, it's a lot of money. It's a lot of freaking hot pockets you got to sell uh, to spend, first of all, one hundred thousand dollars on your kid's admission, and $250,000 uh, on the fine. I will say this. The idea that mommy believes it's a good idea to spend $100,000 to get their kid into college should be, I, I don't know, her own decision, frankly. I mean, we all know that if you buy a building, you get in uh, pretty much with any, uh, with any grade point average. But we should probably de-emphasize the importance of college in our society if parents are willing to do things like this. You know, the idea that they would go to one school, uh, we pay $100,000 to get into this school, they go to another school, and is their life really going to change all that much? Uh, you know, I guess m- maybe they look cute in the uniform. I don't know what exactly the reason is, but it seems like a real overreaction by our legal uh, system here uh, to a bunch of parents that, you know, while, while dumb, I mean, it's a stupid thing to do, well-intentioned. It's, it's someone trying to be a good parent, I think, I think. Um, also want to talk to you about uh, Donald Trump. He went to India. And Trump went to India and had a hell of a, uh, of a showing when it comes to crowd size. I mean, his rallies here are pretty big. Check this one out. Now I'm gonna start. I mean. And hello to India. This is such a great honor. Let me begin by expressing my profound gratitude to an exceptional leader, a great champion of India, 
a man who works night and day for his country and a man I am proud to call my true friend, Prime Minister Modi. Modi. Yeah. This the First Lady and I crowd. have just traveled 8,000 miles around the globe to deliver a message to every citizen across this nation. America loves India. America respects India. And America will always be faithful and loyal friends to the Indian people. I mean, this is some brilliant sagecraft by uh, India. Um, you, know, you know, obviously Trump likes a big crowd. I think anybody would. But it, t- it, does, it does give you... I mean, I don't know if I'm getting sucked in by this, but it does give you that sense of there's a there's a sense of pride there. I, you know, I, I really it makes you like um, like you kind of like what they're doing there. It's smart, obviously, because, you know, kissing Trump's butt is, is a good idea. If you're if you're another country and want to do you know deals with us, that's that's probably a smart thing to do. But in addition to that, it's like I just love it. You know, it's like you want it now you want to kind of like you want to hang out with India a little bit more. You want to maybe take them out on the weekends. Maybe you guys get, you know, you, you hang out, you watch a ball game together. One of my favorite countries on earth is Liberia for that reason. And that Liberia, like here's a, here's a country that named, its capital is Monrovia. It's named after James Monroe. At least it was founded under the idea of actual liberty um, in a very weird backstory that we don't need to get into. But the bottom line is you like when a country looks at America and sees that, you know, the, the, the things that we have that are good. They're not all great. But you like to see the reception. And I like the, I like to see our president actually respected after every other person who, you know, uh, every other leader he bumps into. They're all saying stuff behind his back. They all treat him like crap. And, you know, whether you like Donald Trump or not is not even the point. The point is that you like to see that we can actually get along with people and people are excited to 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 you know, see an American presence. I kind of like that. I don't know if they'd be as excited to see Michael Bloomberg's presence, however. Uh, Bloomberg, uh, he. I mean, between Bloomberg and Sanders, uh, this is just a weird moment. I don't know what's weirder about it. The fact that the Bloomberg guy brought it up or the fact that Sanders apparently actually said this at one point or another. Watch. We've got a candidate who's risen in the polls because of his track record. Bernie has all of this loopy stuff in his background saying things like, you know, uh, women get cancer from having too many orgasms or mm-hmm. toddlers should run around naked and touch each other's genitals to Sorry, insulate what? themselves from porn. Why has what? this stuff not been more surfaced? He's written about women's rape <laughs> fantasies. That hasn't been surfaced. That's the loony side of Bernie. The policy side of Bernie is he has not been good on immigration. He has not been good on criminal justice reform. He was a, an avid backer of the 94 crime bill. He's bad on guns. Yeah. Uh, bad on immigration. And as a legislator, as a member of the Senate, I think he's only sponsored seven pieces of legislation, two for post offices in Vermont. That's a, that's a weird freaking moment of television right there. You can tell he's going to end uh, the 1994 crime bill. Uh, we, the 1994 crime bill. Uh, can you go? What, wait, what did he say exactly? I've never actually heard that one. The rape fantasy one we've talked to you about before. Uh, he, I mean, look, Bernie's had some weird writings in his past. You know, for, for me, that's not I don't need that to not want to vote for him. I, I just don't like the socialism part. Uh, but uh, we'll have to look into those other issues and see if we can dig those up. I really I'm going to assign that to somebody I don't like. Back in a second. So I'm going to be uh, going up to CPAC uh, this week. It's happening, of course, in D.C. I'll be up there. If you happen to also be up there and I'm walking around meandering through the hallways, please come along and, and say hello. Um, now, I'm a little distracted. I don't think I can do the rest of the segment without a pepperoni hot pocket over my shoulder. I don't, I don't know if that's possible with this little notice, but I think it's important. You should subscribe uh, to uh, YouTube and click the bell. Make sure you get those notifications every single time uh, that they, uh, we have a new video out. You're going to get a notification, and that's always fun. And uh, please subscribe as well on uh, podcast. Uh, you know, you guys have been so great as far as reviewing the show with it's great, whatever. Please keep that up because it helps people actually see the show so that I'm not just sitting here blabbing to myself all the time. And that's important to me. Uh, not as important as a pepperoni hot pocket, which somehow, somehow is not here. I mean, this is a disgrace. <laughs>